with it. Okay. And with your permission, everybody, I'm just going to mute everybody for a few minutes for the sheer. And we're going to go here. And we're going to spotlight. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. I feel more comfortable now. So Marty and his wife Sharon are sponsoring tonight's shear. Uh, the shear is being sponsored in commemoration of the Earthside of Mom, uh, uh, Marty's mother, Zihonali Bracha, um, whom I remember well. You know, Marty and I grew up together at Sheer Shemaim for many, many years and had the privilege of knowing both his mother, Zihonali Bracha, and his father. Her, your mom's Earthside, I know, was not tonight, but it was before I think I was away or the, the shear was already taken. So still the Lima Torah for tonight can be a scoop for her neshama. And if Marty and Sharon, if you allow me, I also would like to hopefully uh, pray that the merit of our Talmud Torah together is also a scoop for the neshama of our new grandson who was just born seven minutes ago. And uh, may his parents be privileged so be bismano. And may they be privileged like God will with Torah Kopal Masim Tovim. And may everybody, all of us, all of us be blessed by the Bonish Wolam to celebrate Simcha's good health. We need Simcha. Everybody needs a Simcha. Your heart needs a Simcha. Your Shaman needs a Simcha. And Hashem saw fit to uh, bless us with a Simcha tonight. And I'm so thrilled to be able to share this good news with you right away, right away. It's like, I just said muzzle tov to my son, and then he hung up, and we're back to the shear. So I'm going to, as I said, hope that the shear is one that brings merits to all those who need merit, to all those who need rapua, all those who need Yeshua. And uh, let's let's uh, start shear. Let's start together. Tonight's shear, um, as we mentioned, is um, Parsha Bishalach. Um, otherwise, it's actually called Shabbat Shira because it is in this parsha that we have the beautiful, um, beautiful Shira prophetic poem and song that Moshe leads the Jewish people in after they cross the Yamsuf and witness the downfall of the Egyptians. Shabbat Shira. Uh, but before we get to the Shira, uh, let's begin at the beginning of the parsha, very very beginning of the parsha. And so if you're following along in a Kumash, you're welcome to do so. If not, of course, you can um, just listen. So it's Parakid Gimel, and it's on Pasuk Yudzai. It's Pasuk 17. So let's just take a look at the very first Pasuk and see what we can glean from just reading and understanding, which, by the way, is a, uh, a really important skill. Just read. Read and understand without Rashi. Just understand the words. Understand what is being described. That is a level of studying Chumash. So here it is. Reading from the Stone Translation Interpretation. It happened when Paro sent out the people that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Plishtim, the Philistines, because it was near. For God said, perhaps the people will reconsider when they see a war and they will return to Egypt. Okay, so the Pasuk tells us that Hashem's um, itinerary, the path in which Hashem actually took them from Mitzrayim on route to Eretz Yisrael was a strategic path. That a Hashem made a very deliberate decision. Well, everything that Hashem does is a deliberate decision. But he did so because of a concern. I'll read the concern again in Hebrew. What was the concern? Ki karofu, that this, this land of the Plishtim, which was apparently a direct route was too close. Ki karovu, it's too close. Ki amara lokim, and God said, for God said, perhaps the people will reconsider when they see a war and they will return to Egypt. So, to what is the land of the Plishtim nearer? It's near. But to what is it near? Is it a description of it was close, but 
it's unclear from the language of the Chumash, what is it about the land of Plishtim that Hashem found to be a disincentive? Kids, it was close. But what does that mean it was close? Why would this be a reason for Hashem not to bring a Bnei Israel along that route? So many of the Meforshim interpret the word ki in this pasuk, ki karavu, um, to mean despite the fact, meaning ki doesn't mean because, Meforshim, but despite the fact it was close. So why would Bnei Israel encounter war specifically if they traveled in that direction? Now, all these questions have occupied a lot of Meforshim, a lot of Meforshim. So tonight, I just want to share a commentary from Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, uh, which is a, his full name is shortened by making the, anchor, the acronym Netziv, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, who wrote a commentary in the Pumash called Amek Davar. Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, uh, was the last Rosh Hashiva of the Volodin Yeshiva. And he was the one who decided that it was better to close the Yeshiva than to acquiesce to some of the demands of the Russian government who insisted on having a um, an imposed curriculum on the Yeshiva. And Rabbi Benetziv did not feel that that was a condition that he could tolerate or wanted to tolerate. Okay, by the way, you probably, maybe some of you have heard of um, that there are uh, yeshivas still today that herald from the Nitziv's family. Chaim Berlin Yeshiva is a direct descendant of the Nitziv. Anyways, so I want to take a look at the Nitziv's explanation. And I think this explanation actually is a creative one. So the Nitziv goes through some of the other Meforshim, and he rejects the interpretation that these other Meforshim offer. And he writes that this pursuit points to two different reasons for Hashem's selection of this route. The real reason and the one told to the people. There's the real reason and the one that Hashem, as it were, made public to the Israel. So in truth, Hashem led the people away from this Plishtim route because he did not want them to enter Eretz Canaan quickly. He didn't want them to enter Eretz Canaan quickly. So to be clear, according to the Nazi, that phrase, ki karovu, because it's close, according to the Nazi, means that had they followed that route, they would have, in fact, made their way into Eretz Yisrael fast. And Hashem felt that was wrong. It was wrong to bring them out of Eretz Mitzrayim, to bring them to Eretz Yisrael so quickly. So I just want to read a little bit from the Nitzi. Actually, in a, in a, a free translation um, as uh, we go. So I'm just going to, one second. Okay. Hashem, he's referring, making a parable how Hashem helped shape the unique form of the Jewish people. Because part of the purpose, the goal of this unique um, characteristic of the Jewish people was to isolate them and to actually make them separate from the rest of the nations of the world. Meaning, what's implied here is that the desert experience, which would have, which was part of God's plan, not to bring them in inside directly, but to have them spend some time in the desert was not just a byproduct of the traveling. It was intended. God had intended specifically to delay their, inter their entry because time spent in an isolated desert, not near any nation, was part 
of God's plan. Beneshir al Keneshir al Gozalav Vuhu me oram le cano kishu me rahok mark me rahok nero. Hashem in various places compares or creates this terrible this image of Hashem as this um, eagle caring for the the little babies. But of course, an eagle distances itself. It's able to reach heights that other birds can't. And it becomes this image of the ability to sort of distance from other life forms. And in its ability to create this distance, says the Nisib, the eagle, as it were, the Nesher, is able to train its young in its unique capacities, which are different than other birds. Visham who mivu ar and he says, and that explains this very well. The im hayam olicham derech eretz plishtim shuhu karog had Hashem, in fact, led the Jewish people through the land of the plishtim, which is basically up the coast of Israel near the Mediterranean, which is not far, which will not take long. There is, says the Nitzim, a small desert area between Mitzrayim and the land of Plishtim. That's true. Even though there would have been a small desert, it wasn't sufficient to provide the experience which Hashem felt was going to be formative and shaping the beginning steps, the beginning phase of the Jewish people. And that formative period, says Hashem, is critical. And that's why, the Mitzvah said, the Torah tells us, Ki karofu. the Torah tells us specifically that the land is close because that was its disincentive to get into the land of Israel before the national character had formed before the necessary psychology of the people had formed, would have been the wrong thing to do. Omnam lohaya efshar la hasvir li Yisrael zehatam, sheorei mehem sheitarhu beplishtim, alkein misayem ki amar alokim li Yisrael amar hetatam. But the Nitzir says, it would have been inappropriate, bad timing, a strategic error to tell that reason to the Jewish people. It would have been wrong for Hashem to do that. Why? Again, I'll read that. Lo haya efshar lasvir li Yisrael zatam shia rei mehem shit arhu b'plishtim because Hashem knew that their 210 year experience in Egypt was evidence of a proclivity of the Jewish people to sort of assimilate into the larger society. And if Shem said, we're not going in there because I don't want you to assimilate, that might not have been a disincentive because that's in fact what their experience had been. So that could not have been the reason. No, we're not going this way. We're not going because I don't trust you. That's not an answer. So Hashem, according to the Nitziv, came up with another reason, which according to the Nitziv's explanation, would have been a more convincing thing for the Jewish people to hear, which is what? Well, we go that way, we're going to encounter an enemy and we're going to have to engage in battle. Well, that likely would have maybe scared them off because they may not have felt entirely prepared. After all, they were slaves for 210 years and nobody went to military college. Nobody went to Sahel training. So therefore, says the Nitzib, the Kikarovu is in fact the reason. But that's why the Torah adds the other idea about the fear of war because that's the pretext. A fascinating idea that the Nitzib wants us to understand. Sometimes, you know, we're all parents, sometimes we need to manage, I guess we have to manage our, our, our own fears or the fears of others and figure out what's the best way to give people the tools that they need to, to grow in this situation uh, or, or to be comfortable in a situation and the challenges that it's going to bring. So the Nitzib seems comfortable in saying, Hashem knew what the issue was, and had he told them the absolute truth, they may not have been able to manage it. It's an interesting ethical question. When is it okay and when is it not okay to be 
absolutely truthful. The notion, of course, of course, of truthfulness comes up in a lot of different places in rabbinic literature, but that's not our topic tonight. But I did want to mention this as our opening statement. Okay. One, uh, one other aspect about that that may be worth considering that I had read that I'm going to share with you. So in addition to sort of these two ideas, the approach of the Netziv um, also emphasizes something about the benefit of distinctiveness and independence, maybe even separation of the Torah. It was specifically, as you know, Torah was given where, in which sort of geographical part of the world was given to the Jewish people when they were in a desert, which basically means that they were withdrawn and isolated from other civilizations. And why was that? I mean, everything is strategic. There's no unintentional decision that Hashem makes. So is it possible that the, one of the reasons that Hashem deliberately chose the environment of the wilderness and the desert to share the Torah is to teach us through this message um, the independence that we must sort of foster and build from other value systems. This is our system. This is our value. We need to sort of find the tools to make sure that it takes root deeply in our neshamas and our hearts. Bnei Yisrael's way of life doesn't really always have to conform to that of other people's. And this is precisely the function of their travels through the wilderness. That's what the, that, that's implied in the Nitziv, that that experience of otherness is precisely the experience that gives or gave us the strength to be who we are as, as a nation. Um, unfortunately, I think we live in a time yeah. where being the other uh, is, is really not what many of us want. We want to be like everybody else. We want to assume the same dress code, the same taste in music, the same eating habits, the same you know, all the menu, everything of, of the general culture, we undertake to sort of Judaize. Um, there was a phrase in Yiddish, I don't know if anybody knows this, Azoivius Kristelzech Yudelzech, which basically means uh, the way in which the non-Jewish society develops ultimately is the way often the Jewish society develops because we mirror and take upon ourselves so much of the culture in which we live. But the Torah's point is, maybe our mission is not to be like everybody. Maybe our mission is to be unlike everybody. But it's in that unlikeness, that otherness, that there is a challenge. Some of us um, find that to be a, too difficult a challenge. But be that as it may, that's how the Nitzi wants to open up the partial and explain to us. Okay, I want to share with you a really interesting uh, Siforno, who I've been studying a little bit more this year. And I'm so enamored by his newness of thought. Um, and I'm going to share that with you now. And it has to do with that dramatic scene at the bank of Yamsu. So I'm sure all of us have in our minds what that might look like. Of course, the Pesukim, we're going to take a look at it, describe it to us. So let's just go back. And try, and I know I'm being a little dramatic, maybe a little overly dramatic, but there's, I think, there's a reason for the drama. I think it actually makes the Torah a little bit more exciting and helps us. So let's go back and describe the scene. The scene is they've left Mitzrayim, and they're walking. They're now three days into the desert. Three days into the desert. Rashi tells us it was at this point that Moshe had already told Paro in a previous conversation, we want to go for a three-day journey. That's where we're going to do our rituals, that's where we're going to make our sacrifices, we're going to take everybody with us. And the implication from Moshe Rabbeinu was, and we will return. So Rashi tells us that when Bnei Yisrael left, um, Paro had assigned certain sort of reconnaissance team to follow Bnei Yisrael, because in the back of his mind, even after Makat Bechorot, even after Makat Bechorot, there may have been this thought that they're going to be able to come, leave and come back. So three days have passed, and they don't turn around. It's at that point that this reconnaissance team apparently hightails it back to Paro and tells Paro they're not coming home. They seem to be going forward. And then Paro, realizing that it is now going to look like they're not coming back, that's when he 
rallies the troops. He has a change of heart. The Torah tells us, Vaye, I'm reading now in chapter 14, Perak Yudalit, Pasuk A. And it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled. What do you mean that he was told? He was there in the Ah, That's why Rashi says that there was a, uh, an expectation that they're going to come back. Of course, Pharaoh knew that they left. He knew that. He sent them out. He expelled them. But he expelled them, apparently, on, with, the, with the expectation that they're going to return. Vayugad lemelech mitzrayim ki am. So this reconnaissance group told Paro, no, they're not coming back. They look like they're escaping. So Paro, uh, the heart of Paro and his servants became transformed regarding the people. And they said, what is this that we have done that we have sent away Israel from serving us? So now there's all of a sudden this sort of, I guess they like, what? Hey, what happened? What moment of weakness? What, what got into us? Why did we think we should do this? What have we done? Of course, don't don't forget one of the big motivators to have that attitude is because they've taken all the wealth of Mitzrayim. They basically uh, eliminated almost the basis of the entire economy. Not only did the Makot ruin so much of the fertile area of Mitzrayim with all the various Makot. But B'nai Yisrael actually walked out of Mitzrayim with all the gold and silver. And you can imagine, therefore, that all of a sudden they wake up and they say, not only are our fields damaged, how long is it going to take for us to sort of regroup, replant, and once again reach that level of fertility that we, we were known for? But we have no gold, we have no, so we have no currency, we have nothing. And so no doubt that played a role in hardening his heart and, and his turning his mind. So let's now listen to this. I'm now reading Pasuk uh, Vav. He, Paro, harnessed his chariot and attracted his people with him. People with him. Okay. He took six hundred elite chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. So just be very clear. He's taken 600 of what he calls Rechev Bachur. So this is like the elite squad, the commandos, the the whatever, whatever, like the SEAL team of, of the United States. That's what he's taken. He's taken the top 600 of his best chariot drivers who are capable of who knows what. They're the best trained. And in addition to that, then he's taken what seems to be not just the elite, he's taken everybody. The Shalishim al Kulo. So Shalishim, what are Shalishim? So it becomes, it seems to come from the word three, but as Rashi tells us, and as Sephorno tells us, Shalishim means more than that, means um, he's taken a whole host of military strategies. Stra stra what's the word? Stra those who have strategies in their mind, I can't remember the noun for those people. And those are like the generals, the levels. Those are the guys who are sitting in the war rooms and figuring out what to do. I want to read now with you a little bit about this from Sforno. One other detail that I have to mention, I think I neglected. The very, very beginning, the Torah tells us that when B'nai Israel left Mitzrayim, they left, and here's a word that the Torah says, describes, the chamushim, chamushim alu, chamushim. So that word chamushim is not a common word, and according to Rashi, and not only Rashi, he's quote, quoting here the Midrash, Kamushim comes from the word, here's the Hebrew word, Mizuyani, armed, which means what? It means that in addition to all the gold and silver and candelabras and stuff that the Jewish people took, they also took weaponry. They made a point of taking a lot of those handheld weapons, the bows and arrows, the spears, the 
the, the swords, not because they had a lot of experience, but perhaps in a moment of, I guess, understanding or in intuition, they felt that it would be helpful. Okay. Now, you know the rest of the story. They get to Yam Suf, and as they, they, they reach Yam Suf, they turn around and they see, you can just imagine now, it starts out like a little cloud of dust on the horizon, and then they begin to feel the vibrations on the earth ground, and it gets stronger and stronger, and that cloud of dust gets darker and bigger, and finally you begin to hear the noise, and you realize that what you're seeing is a cloud of dust, is the dust that is being raised by the chariots of the entire Egyptian army. And you can see and you can feel the horses and the screams and the blood curdling cries from the soldiers who want to avenge everything. And there are the Jewish people, they're standing there at the bank of the Yamsu, realizing how are they going to survive this? They have this huge army that is screaming for their blood, and they have the ocean or the, the Yamsu in front of them. How are they going to leave? And based on the Kumashim, the Psukim, most of us have this image that the Nei Israel feel victims, they feel powerless, and they start screaming and shouting until Moshe says, Mati, don't, stop screaming, don't yeah, shout, stand your ground, God will help us. Hashem yilachem lachem ba'chem ta'vishu. You just stand there, God will fight for you, but you must be silent. That's the more prevalent and common description, certainly from Rashi, who is basing himself on Rashi. So it's not Rashi's personal explanation, but he does believe that that is correct. I want you to follow along with me. You, you don't have it in front of you unless you're using a micro But listen to the Siforno's explanation, which is entirely a different story. And uh, at the end, you can tell me whether or not you think that this makes more sense or less sense, and whether the Saforno has convinced you of his perspective. Okay, so Saforno wants, I uh, will start with the Saforno. Okay, so the Torah tells us in this in the Sugvav that the king Paroveet Amola Kahimo he took his nation with him. Nivchar Parashav He took he took like the choicest of his of the entire army with him. Okay, so we're looking at a scene where we've got the elite chasing after. However, listen to this: Vishalishim Al Kulo, and he's taken. The word shalishim. Swarno says, what does the word shalishim mean? Gam al hahamon shelo hayu bichlal amo vechelo hifkid shalishim melumde milchama. So in addition to the elite ones, he's taken a huge other army called hamon shelo hayu bichlal amo vechelo. This is non-trained soldiers. These are just the, perhaps the average citizens who are so upset and angry, they're chasing too. They hopped on their horses and they're going with. Paro brought this group that he, that the Torah calls Shalishim, which are what? These are the top level um, professional soldiers whose job it is, is to sit back in the war room, not to go on the field, and to decide which brigade, which platoon, how to attack, what to do. He's done that. He's smart. Paro's smart. He doesn't want to just engage in street brawl. He brings his elite strategy makers for the army. And those stra strategies, those people working on strategy, are even assigned to lead this Hamon, meaning the non-commando, the non-seal team. He also provides them with shalishim. Ki omnam kol tokef ha-tzava talui v'sar ha-tzava v'chokhmato v'tach bulotav. Swarno says, because if you take a look at the history of war, who wins wars? 
who wins wars is the is the army that has the best strategy, who thinks this through, and doesn't simply plow forward. Because if you plow forward, there are going to be all sorts of problems. So Paro is not just a dummy. He's a clever man. He's He knows what it takes to win a war, and he wants to make sure that everybody there has got a place and a direction so he brings all of the best minds, the military minds. Okay. And now B'nai Israel are standing there, and they see, of course, that Mitzrayim is chasing after them. Now, here's a verse in the story that requires us to just stop and stop the thing. In Pasuk Chet, the Torah tells us, Hashem is making his heart strong, making Paro's heart making his heart strong. Making Paro's heart strong. And he is chastened, he pursues B'nai Israel. And then you find these words, B'nai Israel Yotzim, the Yad Rama. And the children of Israel were going out with an upraised arm. What does that mean? They're going out with an upraised arm. Everything else about this narrative is telling us that B'nai Israel seem to be cornered that they have this superpower coming down with all of the best military technology coming after them. There's a wall of water in front of them, and they're leaving with an upraised arm. What does that mean? And if you actually want us to understand an upraised arm, wouldn't it have made more sense to talk, to make this an emphatic pursuit when they left Mitzrayim, not six days later when they're standing at Yamsu feeling powerless and victims? of circumstances like what's this pasuk doing here and so i think the intentional placement of this pasuk is one of the reasons that the Sephorno makes a, a a bold explanation that honestly i had never heard before and so this is what he says what does it mean you know what that means? That the Jewish people were gathering strength. Hey, we can do this. We can fight them. Can you believe that? According to Sephorno, that image that we had at the beginning of them being hapless and being sort of unable to protect themselves, that's not what this means. The insertion of this basuk in this spot tells us that for right now, there was a very strong, large portion of the Jewish people that lifted up those swords that they took out, Chamushim Israel, and they said, you know what? We can do this. We think we can do this. And why did they think that? Because initially, the group that B'nai Israel had seen coming towards them, the first wave of Pharaoh's army was who? The 600 chariots. 600 chariots can do a lot of damage. But 600 chariots against 600,000 men at the age of 20 and above, maybe way more? Uh, if you take a look at younger than 20, wait a minute, that's a pretty significant group of people. They were feeling so self-assured that when they saw that first wave, you know what they were saying? We can do this. Come on, guys. And everybody started picking up their sword, picking up a spear, picking up whatever they thought they could handle in an attempt to fight the Egyptians. He says, and this just shows the naivety of the Jewish people, because anybody who studied war will know that the larger army is not assured victory. The group that's going to be more likely to win is the group that's prepared, that understands military strategy, that understands about all the ideas of placement and weather and, and logistics. 
They didn't know that. They only saw 600. That's not a problem. They didn't realize at the time with 600 of the best trained soldiers in Egypt, and each one of those soldiers was probably able to take down quite a few Jews by themselves, each one. And B'nai Israel, not having been trained in military strategy, didn't cop that. They didn't understand that. But, but when they saw the next wave come, which was the Hamon, all the other people, and just how fast that number was, that they, Yatsu Biyad Ramah, is the first part. But when it says, Ufaro Hikri, but the second wave, and Paro brought the rest of them closer to engage in battle, Seforno says, Etchel HaHamon Shel Kol Recha Mitzrayim, when he brought that second wave, that's when B'nai Israel started to realize this is a problem. The part about, and, and that meaning this is a problem, that's when they started screaming, that's when they started complaining and said, what, weren't there enough graves in Mitzrayim that you have to bring us here so we can kill us here? We couldn't be buried there. They began to become so overwhelmed by fear. But Paro's, uh, but Seforno's initial explanation is fascinating. And it really challenges uh, it really challenges our, our notion. One minute, I said I was being asked to turn on show captions. Okay, I apologize if that was not. Um, it really they, it really challenges our perception and the narrative that I think most of us grew up with as the Jewish people of quiet and just only complain. This Sforno says not necessarily so. There may have been a period of time, I don't know how long in duration it actually lasted, but there may have been something, a period in which they believed that they had the wherewithal to fight back. It might have been a foolish belief based on ignorance and no experience, but nonetheless, even then there might have been a fighting spirit, a fighting spirit within the Jewish people. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Still with Impera Yudalid. The scene, of course, is the scene of the splitting of the sea. Hashem turns to Moshe and says, Moshe, stop screaming at me and, and ask people to stop dubbing. This is not a time for dubbing. There's always a time for dubbing, but there's also a time not to dubbing and to take action. And in Perik Yud Dalid, as we get closer to the end of the story of the splitting of the Red Sea, and when B'nai Israel saw what actually happened to the Mitzrim, the Torah has this pursuit. Vayari Yisrael et hayad hagedola asher asa Hashem b'Mitzrayim. Israel saw the great hand that Hashem inflicted upon Egypt. Vayiru ha'am et Hashem. And the people revered Hashem. Fear of Hashem, revered Hashem. Vayaminu ba Hashem. And he had faith in Hashem and in Moshe, his servant. What an extraordinary moment that must have been. I don't know if that, that, that would have been one of the moments if I had some way of creating a time machine. I think I would have wanted to witness that. You know, just as a total aside, I attended, it's a lighthearted conference. I attended a, a recent conference Sunday and Monday today, last night in um, New Jersey. And so, uh, I decided to fly Porter Airlines. I don't know if anybody's ever flown Porter, but doesn't fly out of Pearson, flies out of Lord Bishop, as you know. It's a special airport. And I had never done that before. And so uh, maybe some of you have. So Billy Bishop um, runway is a little bit beyond the mainland. And so in order to access it, there was two routes, the ferry, to take a ferry from the dock to the island where the runway is, but that wasn't working. Or you essentially go down the in, in constructing the airport, they have constructed a tunnel which is deep and it goes under the water. So you have to take an elevator and then you walk a little and you take these escalators which go down and further down. And then you walk through the tunnel, then you need to take escalators that go up until you reach the land level of the of the island where the runway is where the planes are and i was thinking as i'm walking through this tunnel 
I'm thinking this is the closest I'm ever going to get to understanding Kriya at Yamsu. To be in a situation where you are surrounded by water, but to walk through it feeling confident that you're not going to be somehow can, you know, swallowed up by the water. And I know I couldn't see the water, but I just had that notion of I'm walking, I'm trusting all these engineers who built this. And I know there are a lot of people that I think this is a 16 year old airport, but there's been a lot of tests and stuff. But I'm thinking, I'm imagining to myself that as I'm walking under this tunnel, there's all this water, Lake Ontario, all around me. And I think, my gosh, I wonder whether that was just a little understanding of what B'nai Israel felt when they walked through Yamsu, surrounded by water, but knowing by Aminu Bashem, who Moshev, though, to have that sense of Emunah. I want to share with you a very short idea by uh, Reb Tzadok of Cohen of Lublin. He was born in 1823. He died in the year 1900. He started off as a, in the Litvish community, but has sometimes been recorded in history. He converted um, not to Christianity, but to Hasidism. And he became more of a Hasidic thinker than he was of a Lithuanian traditional uh, yeshivish thinker. And he wrote many books. Preet Sadik is the first one. You may know, some of you, for those, may know one of his, perhaps his most famous student, Preet Sadik, Sadik of Cohen's most famous student's name is Eliyahu Kitov. Does that ring any bells with anybody? Eliyahu Kitov is the author of, in Hebrew, it's called Sefer HaTodaah. In English, it's a three-volume work called The Book of Our Heritage. If you don't have that book in your library, it is a wonderful collection, which really provides so much rich explanation and background to all the various occurrences and holidays and events on each uh, of the 12 months of the Jewish year. It's divided by the Hebrew months. Eliyahu Kitov, the Book of Our Heritage in English, or Sefer HaTodaah in Hebrew. It's an amazing work. It really is. And he is the star uh, Talmud of the Creed Sadiq, of uh, uh, Sadiq Cohen. So Sadiq Cohen writes something. It's not long, but it's so it's just so profound. And of course, it sounds Hasidic, but I want to share it with you. This verse that I just read tells us that B'nai Israel had emunah in Hashem and in Moshe. And here's what the Pritzadik says. Kishem should sarich adam l'amin b'Hashem yitarach, as a person must have faith in Hashem, may he be blessed. Kain sarich achar kach l'amin b'atzmo. He also, after, first you have emunah in Hashem, he also has to have emunah in himself. Ritzon Ulamar, this means, Sheyesh la Hashem yitbarach esek imo. You have to believe that Hashem has a connection to you, that he's interested in you. V'she'enenu po'el batel, and that you're not sort of an irrelevant creation that works and lives in this world. V'kechayoto sadeh she'lachar mitatam nevdu v'enam. Like some sort of animal in the field that dies, and nobody cares about them. They're dead. It's a carcass. Who cares? It's an animal. That's not us. We have to not only believe in Hashem, we have to believe in ourselves, and we have to believe that Hashem believes in us and has to us, has a relationship with us. That our lives, our neshamas, are connected to the essential source of all life. Uh, and Hashem takes pleasure and joy when we do that which Hashem wants of us. And this is the meaning of the Pasuk, and they believed in Hashem and they believed in Moshe's servant. Perush meaning Moshe Ritzon Olamar, that when the Torah says that they believed in Moshe, Moshe here is not just a figure, an individual historical figure who was born of a man and a woman. It's referring here to Moshe who becomes, as it were, a representative, a symbol of the entire Jewish people. So when they saw what they saw at Yamsu, by Aminu Bashem of Moshe Do, says Preet Sadiq in this typical Hasidic manner, it's basically saying not only did they believe in Moshe, they believed in everything that Moshe stood for, which is them, the nation, the greatness of the Jewish people, each one of them having a role to play. 
Perush Moshe, Klal Shishim, meaning the 600,000 souls. That's of the males, but it wasn't just meaning. That means everybody. Haminu Shashem Mitbarach Chafetz Behem. They believe that Hashem wants, is interested, and concerned with each and every one. Umamela Gum came to Moshe, and of course with Moshe specifically, but not just. Asher Hu Mamashem, because he, Moshe Rabbeinu, as it were, represents them. Vayaminu Vashem Moshe, we recite that every single day. It's part of our Pesukei de Zimra. And perhaps, as the Creed Sadiq, why is that part of your Pesukei de Zimra? Why is this Pesuk so important to us? Because every day we have to believe. We have to believe that Hashem believes in us. It's not just our belief. It's not a one way. It's we believe in Hashem. We believe in ourselves. We believe in our capacity. We believe in our ability. And as I've said many, many times before, and no doubt that you've heard or read before, the reason we wake up every morning is because Hashem believes in you. If Hashem no longer had believed that you have anything to contribute, you would not wake up in the morning. But the fact that each of us wakes up in the morning is an indication that not only does Hashem believe in us, he wants us to believe in ourselves. And that's why, of course, the very first thing that the Jew says when he opens his eyes and wakes up, Hashem, we thank you so much. We are so grateful for you that if you have turned our Neshamas to us with compassion in the last two words, Rabba Emunatecha. Your emuna Hashem is great. And the classic question, which is not, I know it sounds like I've said this before, but it's so critical. What do you mean Hashem's faith is great? We always think of faith as a one-way thing. We have faith in Hashem. It's like an arrow pointing up. How could you talk about Hashem having faith? That's not the way we think about faith. We have emuna Hashem. But that's not what we're saying. Rabba emuna techa means your emuna. And who does Hashem believe? He believes in us. And that's why you wake up every day. You wake up every day as a sign that Hashem says, you're not finished. You have what to do in this world. There will come a time after 120 where whatever it is that we were sent to do, whatever our tough key is, will be done. And so that's our job. Our job is to do that. And I've said this before. We don't get to control the amount of days that we live. What you get to control is the quality of the days that you live. What you do between sunrise and sunset is your choice. How many days is Hashem's choice? But when you wake up every day, that's another way of Hashem saying, I think you can make the days between your sunrise and your sunset valuable and important. Okay, so going on to then the Shira that we recite every day, it's also part of our davening. The very first part of the Shira, the very first, as it were, prophetic statement that Moshe makes, and now reading from Perak Tetvav, is this. I shall sing to Hashem, for he is exalted above the arrogant. Ashir Hashem ki he is above, exalted above those who are arrogant, from the word gaiva, ga'ava, sus having hurled horse with its rider into the sea. Let's stop for one second. So as Moshe begins his prophetic song, and he begins to respond to the miraculous event of Kriyat Yamsu. The first part of that miraculous event that he chooses to present in this prophetic song is, is what? What's the image? Sus virachvo ramabayan. You can just see it, um, scary as it is, all these big, military horses trained and they're now just being hurled like little pebbles through the waves of Yamsuf that are now coming crashing down and you're standing and you're watching the rider on the horse and the horse itself just getting tossed around all through the water. Terrible. It's a terrible scene. Rav Baruch Levi Epstein wrote two uh, major works on Kumash. The first is called Toritz Mima and the second is called Tosefet Bracha. Um, the Tosefet Bracha is a supplementary supplementary work to his first work called Torah Mima. And in his supplementary work called the Tosefet Bracha, the, Torah, the uh, Rabbi Baruch Levi Epstein asks an interesting question. If Moshe Rabbeinu's Shira that we recite every day is a prophetic response to Yamsu, of all the images to begin with, 
why does he choose this image of the horse and the rider getting tossed around? What should be the first image? What should have been the first image? Well, the first image that should have sort of captured his imagination and our imagination when we read this to you every day is the splitting of the water. It should have read something, Ashir Lashem ki go ga'ah, he mayam suf baka, like he, he split the waters. That was a huge miracle. That's unbelievable. That should have been Moshe Rabbeinu's opening image, and then he can go from there and include all the other psukim. But that's not how he starts. He starts with the other image. So the Tosef Baruch Baruch Levi Epstein wonders of all the images, why I picked that? And then he says, not only am I not sure of why he picked that, of all the things that happened at Yom Suf, this is the least miraculous. Like, don't forget, this is the Middle East. So obviously there are, in the Middle East, there are bodies of water. So clearly the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Jordan River, the, uh, the uh, Kinneret, and even within Israel itself and other parts, the Nile, and there are other bodies of water. So if you're living in an area in which you encounter bodies of water, do you think that there are ever reported cases of people drowning? Of course there are. Of animals drowning? Of rafts capsizing? Probably. This isn't the first time. So of all the images, why include an image that looks and feels like it's not in and of itself miraculous? Like animals getting, you know, capsizing. In a story, remember the story maybe of Black Beauty, you know, the ship that sank and the horse that saved itself ran to the beach and the relationship between the boy and the black. But that story is based on the whole idea of a ship capsizing that had a horse on it and then the whole story develops. It happens. Of course it happens. So there's so little about that, says the tor says uh, Rabbi Baruch Levi Epstein, that sounds miraculous. But the splitting of the Red Sea, that's, that's unequivocal. So why go there? And so his answer is an interesting one. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, well, Moshe Rabbeinu shows that precisely because of that reason that it seems to be natural. And Moshe Rabbeinu was, as it were, setting the stage for all of us not to be confused by where miracles reside. If you only see miracles in the splitting of the Red Sea, look how much of life you are missing. There are miracles that are all around us in nature. I mean, my daughter-in-law had a baby at 7.55 tonight. Is that a miracle? I'm going to say yes. Oh, but it's really not. It's like, you know, it's biology. And, okay, there's, I get that. But there's something about the regular, the natural, that I believe is miraculous. And I think, says the Tosef, the Baruch Alevi, maybe Epstein, that was the purpose. Yet the very first image in what ultimately becomes a daily prayer for Jews everywhere throughout the world, we're going to recall this moment. Let's begin recalling it by that which can somehow be assigned to the natural world. Because our task is not only to recognize the supernatural, but is to recognize the divine in those things that surround us all the time. And that's always, that, that can sometimes be a difficult task because it's not always easy, or we don't always stop to do that. We're more likely to be awed and impressed by the splitting of the sea miracle and way less so. I remember uh, one of the late, one of the rabbis used to be the rabbi of Sheresh Mayim, his name is Rabbi Emmanuel Foreman, Foreman uh, I remember I was a much younger person there, I was a teenager, I think, when he was the rabbi of the shul. I remember him telling us a story about himself. Uh, his name is Emmanuel, his name at home is Manny. And he remembers sitting at the um, table with his grandfather. Do you remember transistor radios, everybody? I don't think any, I don't know if anybody remembers, but he remembers sitting at the kitchen table with his grandfather and they had a transistor radio on the table. And it was playing, it was on. And his grandfather looks at him and says, Manny, look at this. It's not plugged in. I don't understand how it's working. Rabbi Foreman says he turned to his aides and said, Zadie, 
when it is plugged in, you do understand how it works. You know, so many of us take for granted so many things that are surround us on regular day that we, oh yeah, of course that's how it works. Wait a second, do you really know how it works? Do you know how that works? We don't, because we just take things for granted. Be that as it may, that's the two separate bracha rabbi, Baruch Levi Epstein's take on why the shira begins with a sus verach mo, sus verach mo, Okay, continuing in Perak Tedvav, I want to get to Pasuk Yud Chet. Pasuk Yud Chet. As we come to the end of the Shira, we find the following words, Hashem yimloch le'olam va'ed, Hashem shall reign for all eternity. So this pasuk actually ends not only the Shira, but also, also you may know in Pirkei Avot uh, as well, the final Mishnah of Masechet Avot, and here's the English, whatever the Almighty created in this world, he created only for his glory, as it stated, everything that is called by my name, it is for my glory that I have created it. I have formed it. Indeed, I have made it. That's taken from Sefer Yishayahu. And it says, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. So a very close look at this Mishnah might raise some questions as to uh, why this is included. So the verse in Sefer Yishayahu is cited as like a proof text to the Mishnah's assertion, this Pasuk in Yeshaya sort of proves what the Mishnah is asserting, that whatever Hashem created, He created for His glory. What does the Mishnah add by saying Hashem in Lachulam Ho'ed, which is from Shirat Hayam? That's where it comes from. So the Midrash Shmuel explains that this final quote, Hashem in Lachulam Ho'ed, responds to the challenge that maybe uh, many people will pose to the theory advanced in the mission, which is, if Hashem truly created everything in the universe for His own glory, everything in the world is there somehow to add to and bring glory to Hashem, then why does the vast majority of what's alive, what's ex what exists in the world, why does so much of it seem opposed to the glory of Hashem? So if that's the purpose of the world, to bring cover to Hashem, why is it that when we look around the world, it seems like so much doesn't bring cover to the to Hashem, it just takes us in the opposite direction. Why is there so much hatred? Why is there so much bloodshed? Why is there so much greed? Why is there so much corruption? Why does the world look so devoid of godliness if it was created to give godliness, to make it possible for us to show how God's greatness exists? So what does the mission say to that? Oh, Hashem, Hashem will reign. Will reign in the future. Not Hashem Molech, but Hashem Yimlo. True, the intended purpose of the world has yet to be realized. But in the future, however, Hashem will establish that greatness. His kingdom of the world will be established, so to speak. And we'll see how really great and godly the whole world is. That's one answer. That's one answer. Hashem, yim loch li ulam by the future. We're not in a yim loch stage, unfortunately. There are pockets of it. But the world as a whole, we're not. But I want to share with you as the last word for tonight, a different approach, a different sort of answer to that. So this explanation also um, reads the final part of the Mishnah as anticipating the challenge of cynics. Oh, you know, what are people going to say? So according to the approach I'm sharing with you now, the cynics ask, the cynics ask, even if Hashem created everything for his glory, of what purpose of it is it if he's not acknowledged? So if the things were created to give glory to Hashem, 
and nobody gives glory to Hashem. So what's the purpose of it? Ah, it's over the future. But why create it to begin with? The Mishnah responds, Hashem yimloch li'olam v'ed. Mortal kings, human kings, lose the, their title the moment they lose their constituency. So you can't rule without subjects. That's clear. There can be no monarchy without subjects. If you don't have a land over which to rule, then you're not a king. Hashem, however, rules forever and ever, regardless, regardless of what transpires, irrespective of the events that transpire in the world, he is always, um, Hashem always is ruling. He is revered, um, or maybe even ignored, but God created everything for his glory. But nevertheless, his rule and dominion is never undermined when human beings fail to recognize it. I don't recognize Hashem, it doesn't mean he's not there. Like if you wanted to um, challenge Hashem as, oh my God, I don't believe in Hashem. My challenge won't affect Hashem one way or the other. So therefore, that explanation says, I will never be able to undermine God's position. That's the second. I want to end with the last, the third. Tiferet Yisrael, one of the um, expositors of the Mishnah of Tiferet Yisrael, you can buy this set of uh, Mishnayot, suggests a third interpretation of the Mishnah. When Hashem created everything for his honor, as is indicated in his last Mishnah, but the specifics of how this is, that eludes us. I get Hashem created for his honor, but how does that actually work? We can't identify the particular um, the particular function towards this end served by every creation or object in the world. I don't know. I don't know why this rock brings Hashem's cover. I don't know. I don't know why this animal or that. That I don't know. I really don't. If everything in the world, I assume the mission, the mission is telling us everything created in the world it brings cover to Hashem. I cannot tell you how each thing accomplishes that goal. We often find it really difficult even to identify with certainty the roles that we as individuals must assume in this effort toward Kavod HaShemayim. I don't, I'm not even sure what I should be doing. Forget the app, me. I don't know. But like, what's my tough key? What's my job? How do I make that happen? What do I do every day? Where, what decisions should I be making that is going to make Hashem's glory greater? It's a big question. What que what should I be doing? We don't usually stop and think about that. We make our decisions because we think that they're going to be beneficial to us. Not everybody stops to think, was my decision beneficial to Hashem? Could I be making a decision that would be a greater Kiddush Hashem than this one? Interesting question. Hashem yim loch le'olam va'ed refers to the next world when we all, all discover the truth about all that Hashem created and determine definitely the role played by every object. I may not ever get the answer to that question. So the Tiberi Yisrael says, Hashem means that throughout our lives, we make the best decisions we can. We try. We have to be guided by certain principles. But if you're looking for an answer of certainty in your life, it's not going to happen. Or this is going to bring me the right result. This will. There's nobody alive who can do that. There's nobody who can say that. Hashem yim lochli olam ba'ed, which we say every day, may be a reminder that we will do the best we can in this world, and we trust that in the next we'll find out perhaps the bigger truth that lies for all of us to see. But while we're in this world. We can't escape our decision-making process. And we can't say, God, it's in your hands. It's not. It's in our hands. But we have to be guided, as I said, by certain principles. And the one day after 120 years, when Hashem gives us the opportunity to be in his presence in the Olam Shal Emet, then perhaps we'll fully understand. And that will be a moment of Hashem Yimulah the Olam Ba'ed. Meantime, I want to wish that all of us have a Olam Hazeh, that is filled with all the right principles of emunah, bitachon, health, simcha, and bracha. I invite you all to um, unmute yourselves.
And again, thank you, Marty and Sharon. And um, I'm happy to have shared my personal sin for all of you, the birth of the grandson tonight at about 7.55. Mazel tov, mazel tov, mazel tov. Mazel tov. Thank you. Mazel tov. A shout out family. A beautiful, beautiful. Mazel tov. Thank you so much. <laughs> So thrilled to be able to share that. I admire how can you carry on under such circumstances, <laughs> just additional I'll tell, red I'll tell you why. Because I hope that our Torah together should be a source for this little boy. That's why. Beautiful. I don't Great. think I could give him a better gift than that. Amen. I think that's a, Amen. 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 That's a special Amen. gift. To be and warmest today. regards to Rochelle. Beautiful. Thank you, Saul. That is such a lovely thing. Thank you. I really appreciate you. And thank you everybody for joining tonight. I want you to know how much I appreciate that you come and learn. We have a chance to- Well, have a Lachayim on Shabbos. Have a wonderful <laughs> week, <a steak laughs> week. And I hope the Shabbos is supposed to be very, very cold. So if, if you're going to be coming to Shul, make sure you put on your lunga gatkis, make sure you dress warmly, get out there <laughs> now. A Lachayim will, will warm us up. Oh, <laughs> that, that's, that's good. That's absolutely so true. So I'm going to go now so I can have a chance to catch up on all the news. Be well, everyone. Each of you have a wonderful, wonderful week. You too. Thank you, Robert. Mazel tov. Mazel tov.